The topic of this video is consumer theory. The goal of consumer theory is to derive the demand function of the consumer. There are three parts to the theory. First, we are going to talk about the budget constraint. The budget constraint shows all the bundles of different goods a consumer can purchase given prices and income. Next, we are going to talk about consumer preferences, which indicate what the consumer likes. Here, it is very important to keep in mind that consumer preferences do not depend on the budget. You can have preferences for a good which you cannot afford. It is only in the third part we are going to look at consumer choice. So what does the consumer actually purchase given budget constraint and given consumer preferences? So let us start with the budget constraint. Now, first of all, when we are going to talk about consumer theory, we are looking at the two goods case, okay? In the sense that we are only looking at consumer choice, assuming that there are two goods that can be purchased. Now, you may think that this is limited or limiting because there are many other goods out there. But note that the goal of a theory is to derive important conclusions and if we can arrive those important conclusions only with uh, two goods then uh, the theory is actually perfectly fine. It turns out that if we assume the case of two goods that we can still make a lot of useful predictions. Now assume that those two goods let us call them x and y. Okay. Or if you do not like X and Y, you can also think about apples and milk. Okay. Now, we have those two goods and the quantities purchased or the, the quantities not yet uh, purchased, let's call them QX and QY. Okay. Now, those two goods also have prices. And let's call those prices Px and Py. Okay, so the price of x and the price of y. Now, you also have income, or the consumer also has income. And let's call this income B. Sometimes you also see that it is simply uh, abbreviated with I. Sometimes you also see an M, okay? But let's, uh, for this video, let us stay with an um, income designated as uh, B, okay? So now let's see what the budget constraint actually looks like. If you're going to a store, think about you're going to a supermarket, and you're coming to the checkout after purchasing or after choosing various items, in order to determine how much you have to pay, what happens is that the quantity of a particular good is multiplied with the price of that good. And then it is summed up for all the goods that you have uh, purchased. So here, in order to derive the budget constraint, we are going to do the same in the sense that we are taking the price of x times the quantity of x plus the price of y times the quantity of y. Okay. Now, we know what the prices are. We also know what your income is. Okay. And then, of course, the uh, what you what you potentially expe uh, expend on the uh, on the goods and purchases uh, on the goods has to be smaller than your budget. Note that, and we are going to talk about this when we talk about um, uh, consumer preferences and optimal choice. Theoretically, you could have um, the the goods or the expenses have to be smaller than your budget. It turns out that we will soon see that you always exhaust your budget. Okay. So there is, there will be an equal sign, okay? So what this means is that you have income and what you possibly spend on, um, on X and Y has to be equal to your income, okay?
Now, how does this look like um, in a uh, graphical? So for this example, we are going to assume that we have an income of $100, that we have the price of X, which is equal to $10, and that the price of Y is equal to $5. Okay. Now, to illustrate your budget constraint or to illustrate all the bundles of QX and QY that you can purchase, let us do this graphically. Okay. So here, let us put the quantity of x on the horizontal axis and the quantity of y on the vertical axis. Okay, so here it is important that we have physical quantities. Okay, so the thing about the number of apples and the, the gallons of milk on the axis. Okay, now to in order to draw the budget constraint or in order to show off, well, what are the, all the possible um, uh, bundles or quantities of X and Y which you can buy with your budget? The easiest way of do this, okay, is to say, okay, what happens? How many units of X can I purchase if I spend all my money on X, okay? And so if I spend all my money on X, I have a budget of uh, or an income of 100, each unit of X costs uh, $10. So hence, I can purchase a maximum of uh, 10, dot, 10 units of X, okay? Now, if I spend all my money on Y, then Y costs $5, I have $100. So the maximum amount of units I can purchase of Y is equal to 20. So now the question is how does the budget constraint or how does the how can you connect those points? Now in order to do so, let us solve this equation in terms of um, QY. Okay, so you can rewrite, so you want to isolate QY on one side. Okay? So you can rewrite this. You can have uh, you take PX times QX. You Subtract on both side, both sides. So you have B minus PX times QX is equal to PY times QY. And then you can divide both sides by PY and that will allow you to isolate QY. So we have QY is equal to B minus PX times QX divided by PY. Okay, now let's rewrite this slightly by saying your budget divided by PY minus PX over PY times QX. Okay. Now you see that you have a linear function here, okay? So what do I mean by linear? B is your income and PY is known. So this represents the intercept. Now you have the ratio of the prices. So we have negative px over py. This represents the slope. So your budget constraint is a linear function. Now note that your budget is 100, py is 5. So 100 divided by 5 is the intercept is 20. Okay, so we are on the right track here. And the slope is the negative of the prices. So what this means is that between the 20 and the 10, in this case, 
we have a straight line. This line is your budget constraint. If you are exactly, if you are choosing a bundle of QY, or if you're choosing a combination of QY and QX, which is exactly on this line, then you are spending exactly $100. If you are spending less, or if you're, if you're choosing a bundle somewhere in the triangle here, then you are spending less than your budget, but you can still afford it. So this is called your budget set. Anything outside your budget set, so anything in this area here, is not affordable. Okay, you cannot, you cannot afford it. Now, you can also see the advantage of simply using two goods because it is easily representable in a graph. Now, let us move on and consider what happens to the budget constraint when things change. We are going to look at two changes. We are going to first look at the change in income and then we're going to look at the change in price. So let us start with income first. We have seen that the budget constraint consists of an intercept, budget over the price of Y, and a slope, which is the negative of the prices of the goods, and that it is a linear line. In a base situation, we had a budget of 100, and hence, if the price of X is equal to 10, then we can purchase 10 units of X. And if the, per the price of Y is equal to five, we can purchase 20 units of Y. Now let us consider what happens if the price, uh, if income changes in the sense that we are not making $100 anymore, but our income increases to $150. Now note that the budget constraint is, um, is influenced via the intercept. Right? Because now you have 150 divided by the price of y, which is 5, minus px over py, which is 10 over 5, times qx. So this is now your new budget constraint given the higher income. Note that the slope has not changed because the prices remain the same. And it is only your income that has changed, or it is only the intercept that has changed. It is now 150 divided by 30, uh, 150 divided by 5, which is equal to 30. So with the higher income of 150, you can purchase more goods. So the new intercept is 30. And here, if you spend all your money on, uh, on X, it would be 150 divided by 10. So now you can purchase 15 units of X and 30 units of Y. And since we only have a change of the intercept and not of a slope, a change in income results in a parallel shift of the budget constraint. So like this. Okay. So Change in income results in a parallel shift of the demand function, uh, of the budget constraint. So if your income were to decrease, then the budget constraint would shift to the left. Now, what happens if we actually change the price? Now, for this second example, assume that we are still having an income of $100 but now that the price of y is equal to five. So now we have the budget constraint 100 divided by 10 minus 10 over 10 times qx 
is equal to your budget. Now note that in this case, two things have changed. Your intercept has changed because Y is getting more expensive and hence you can purchase less goods of Y, but also the slope has changed. So this part here. So before the slope was negative two, now the new slope is negative one. So if you were to spend all your goods on X, uh, all your budget on X, then you could still afford 10 units of X. However, if you spend all your uh, budget on Y, now you can only afford 10 units of Y and not 20 units anymore. Plus your slope or the, the, the slope has changed because we have now a change in the prices and hence your new budget constraint pivots around this point. Okay. Now note that your budget constraint, if the prices increase, if both prices increase by, uh, by 20%, okay. So if the, if the, if the uh, ratio or the slope does not change, okay then if both prices increase by, increase by 20%, we are effectively having a shift of the budget constraint, but the slope would remain the same. Okay. So change in income results in a parallel shift of the budget constraint and a change in prices results in a change of the slope. Okay. And this change of the slope assumes that the prices change in different, uh, different ratios. Now note that this, uh, this analysis of this straight line uh, between, between two points is only valid if the, uh, if the prices do not change over the range, in, um, over the range of uh, quantities that you purchase. So it is not going to be a straight line if you actually have, for example, discounts, if you have discounts, for example, on quantities in the sense that if you're purchasing more than uh, five units, the remaining goods, uh, the remaining units are going to be cheaper. Okay. So you really have to be very careful of how you draw the budget constraint. Another example of where the budget constraint is not a straight line is when you have uh, restrictions of what you can purchase. Now, let us have a look at the example of food stamps. So suppose that your budget is equal to 100 and that the price of food is equal to $2, make here the dollar sign, and that the price of uh, other goods, let's just call them goods, is equal to $1, uh, $1. But in addition to the cash income you have, there is also uh, food stamps in the amount of $20. Okay. Now note that food stamps, you can only purchase food items with food stamps and you cannot purchase other goods. Then the question is, how is this going to change your budget constraint? So let's draw the budget constraint, where on the horizontal axis, we have the quantity of food. And on the vertical axis, we have other items, okay, or other goods. Now, if you were to spend all your money on food, you can, could, could purchase $100 worth of food plus $20 from the food stamps. Since the price of a food is uh, $2, then you can purchase a total of 60 units from, uh, 
with the food stamps. Okay, you can purchase 60 units of food. Now, if you were to spend all your money on other goods, then you could not purchase $120 worth of other goods, but only $100. Okay. 100, sorry, you can only purchase 100 units of other goods. Okay. Because you are now the $20, you could not be spending on the other goods. So you only have $100, not $120. So in this case, you actually have a kinked budget constraint that, that looks like this. Okay. And the kink. is at 10 units of food. Because if you're purchasing 10 units or more of food, then you're purchasing at least a 20 dot, you're purchasing, uh, you're spending at least uh, $20, so 10 times $2, which is equal to the $20 in food stamps, okay? So if you're spending more than 10 units on uh, food, or if you're spending, if you're purchasing more than 10 units on of food, spending more than $20, then you are in this regular budget constraint. Before we start consumer preferences, I would like you to consider this 3D representation of Mount St. Helens. Okay, note that this is a very rough draft or very rough uh, representation, but uh, it should get the point across. So if you have a mountain like this, okay, uh, and you can see this sometimes on a map, so on the bottom graph, you have this 3D representation, which is actually uh, very difficult to, uh, to understand, to see of how high things are. Now here it is slightly different because the higher points are marked with a red color, whereas the lower points are marked with a blue color. Now note that this 3D representation, you can also uh, show that as a 2D representation. When you actually look from, uh, from the top, and that when you are representing what are called contour lines, okay? Now note that this is something you have in every map. Even, even if you open, for example, uh, Google Maps, you can click on terrain and then it will give you those contour lines. And what those contour lines are is that they are connecting all the points that have the same altitude or the same height, okay? So, for example, you may have this at uh, this point here or this line here which represents all the points that are at say 3000 feet high now the important part is that if you have the line that is 3000 feet high and, and you have another line that is say 2500 feet high then those lines cannot cross okay you cannot be at the same time at 3000 feet than you are at uh, 2500 feet now, we are going to get back to this concept about, uh, about contour lines when we are talking about uh, utility functions and indifference curves. But I would like you to remember that what we are going to see uh, soon when we are talking about uh, utility, that um, we are going to have a 3D picture, okay? Or we are having a 3D object. This will be the utility function. And we are trying to represent it in a 2D space or in a two-dimensional space using contour lines. And we are going to call those contour lines uh, indifference curves. There are certain assumptions that we are making about the preferences of consumers. And let me go through those uh, assumptions right now. The first assumption is called completeness. Now, consider that you have two bundles, A and B, okay? So when I mean by uh, bundles is think about um, shopping carts that contain di different uh, quantities of various goods, okay? Then what completeness means is that if we are having those two consumption bundles, A and B, that we can always make a comparison. Either A is preferred to B, 
Okay, so we are using this uh, symbol here that we prefer A over B. Or we can say that B is preferred to A. Or we can be indifferent between A and B. Okay, so in the sense that um, you can, you are fine with either A or B. Okay, so that is what is called uh, completeness. Now, transitivity is if we have three consumption bundles, say A, B, and C, then in the case of transitivity, we have the following. If you prefer A over B, and if you can prefer B over C, that implies that A is preferred to C. Okay, so let's make an example here. Say if you have three cars, say you have a Toyota. Uh, let's call it a, a, a VW and a Chevy. Okay, then if you prefer the Toyota over the VW and you prefer the VW over the Chevy, that also means that you prefer the Toyota over the Chevy. Okay. Now, non-satiation, think about this as very simply that more is better. Okay. Now, we have seen this uh, before when we talked about the uh, budget constraints, where I said that you always exhaust your budget. Well, the reason why you are always exhausting your budget is because as we assume that consumers are non-satiated. So more is always better. Now, in order to explain the last assumption, the diminishing marginal utility, let us introduce uh, utility functions first. Okay, and then once I have introduced a uh, utility function, utility functions, uh, it will become easier to explain the diminishing marginal uh, utility. Okay. Now, think about uh, utility as the satisfaction you get from consuming goods. Okay. So um, you can use a satisfaction, or you can think about happiness. But the economists talk about uh, utility. So I will be continuing to use this term uh, utility. Now, you cannot eat money, okay? So you can only take money or the income you have and then convert it into, into goods that you can consume. And you are getting satisfaction from those, from those goods. Now, let us start very easy in the sense that we have one good, okay? And now suppose that this uh, first good is um, ice cream. Okay. And also think that we are on um, that we are on a hot uh, hot summer day. Now to draw uh, your first utility function. Okay. Then we have this uh, two-dimensional graph where we have the quantity of ice cream on the uh, horizontal axis, okay? And we have the, so this is ice cream, okay? And then we have the utility or the happiness on the vertical axis. Now, you will see that there are no units associated with utility, okay? Um, and just think about um, utility as some measure. It will become clear later that we do not need to attach any type of unit uh, to, uh, to utility, but that uh, simply by of how it's drawn, of how we are graphing it out and what type of assumptions we are making, that we can still, um, still make uh, predictions about the behavior of consumers, even, if this, uh, even with this abstract concept of utility. Now, let's get back to the ice cream example here on a hot summer day. Now, if you have zero ice cream, okay, 
So you are starting with uh, zero at speed. And then you are not going to have any utility, okay? Because uh, you're only gaining a utility from actually eating ice cream. And now for this example, uh, assume that you have very small ice cream cones, okay? So that overeating um, is not, not, not a problem, at least here in this, in this lower bound, okay? So <clears throat> it's a hot summer day, you're getting your first ice cream, then your utility is going to increase, okay? Your utility is going to increase by quite a bit from the first bite of ice cream, maybe also from the second bite of ice cream. Okay, but the more ice cream you eat, okay, the your utility is going to increase even further. But the additional gain you get, the additional gain in utility you get from eating more ice cream, okay, is not going to be as big as from the first bites. Okay, so. What this means is that your utility, while still increasing, the rate at which it is increasing is uh, flattening out, okay? And note that here um, it will, it may plateau, but it will never go down, okay? So don't, um, so don't, uh, don't think about uh, overeating on ice cream, okay? So let's consider that we have, again, we have those uh, small cones or think about that you have very small bites. So think about this as the first unit of ice cream. Think about this as the second, third, fourth, and say fifth unit of ice cream. Okay. Then there are those are those are the phys physical quantities. And then that you can look at the utility. Okay, from those various from those uh, various cones. Okay. Suppose that for the first bite, you are actually getting, say, um, a utility. And again, just uh, think about this as some imaginary unit. You get a utility of five, okay? That is when you are going from zero to one cone. <clears throat> but then I said that, well, if you're going to the second cone or the second unit of ice cream, okay? that your utility is still increasing, but not, not as much as from the first cone, okay? So here your utility may be increasing from five to nine, okay? And then the same is true for going from the second cone to the third cone, where your utility may go to 12, okay? So here, and this is going to be a very important concept, concept which we are going to talk about uh, very often in this class, is this concept of marginal, okay? <clears throat> so here, we're going to talk about the concept of uh, marginal utility. And marginal means the, in this case, the additional utility you get from an additional unit of ice cream, okay? So it is not the total utility, but it's the marginal, the additional utility. So we can abbreviate this with uh, MU, okay, for marginal utility. So then the marginal utility you get from the first ice cream cone is the, uh, is the five, right? So those are the five units of utility. But then the utility you get from the second ice cream cone is from five to nine, and hence the marginal utility from that second ice cream cone is only four. And then if you go further, the marginal utility from the third ice cream cone is going to be from nine to 12. The marginal utility is three. So as you can see, the more ice cream cones you get, your utility is still increasing, but at a decreasing rate, okay? Now, this is what we mean by the concept of diminishing marginal utility, okay? That your marginal utility, as you increase quantity, is diminishing or is going down. And note that this makes sense for um, this makes sense for uh, uh, mostly a lot of consumption goods, right? That the satisfaction you get or the increase in satisfaction you get is highest for the 
first bite, okay? Think about if you're very hungry or if you're very thirsty, then the first bite feels best. And then say, going from the fourth to the fifth bite, uh, you actually get, of course, and course, an increase in utility, but it is much smaller than from the first bite. Here is a computer generated graph of illustrating the relationship between utility and marginal utility. On the left hand side, you can see a utility function where you have the quantity of a particular good on the horizontal axis and you have the associated utility from consuming the good on the vertical axis. Now, on the right hand side, you have the information depicted but in terms of marginal utility in the sense that if you're going from zero to uh, one unit consumed, your marginal utility is going to be very high, okay? Because think about the, uh, think about the marginal utility as the slope or the steepness of the utility function, okay? So for example, if you are at, at, uh, at one unit, okay? Then the slope of the utility function is, uh, is, is, is here and then this corresponds to the slope or the, the slope here corresponds to the marginal utility and the further you are increasing your consumption then the slope is going to decline over the quantity of consumption okay? so the slope for say six units is flatter than for the first unit okay and hence you see that the marginal utility here is, uh, is uh, smaller, okay? So this is another way of thinking about marginal utility as the slope or the steepness associated with the utility function. Let us move to the case of two goods. Now, the example we are going to consider next is milk and apples. So here in this table, uh, what you see is you have on the, on the top, you have apples and you have the quantities one, two, three, four, and so on. On the sideline, you have uh, milk, you have one, two, three, which are the physical units of milk and the physical units of apples. Now, if you consider one unit or if you consume one unit of milk and one unit of apples, then let us assume that you are getting a utility of 25. The same is if you have a consumption of apples of four and you're consuming three gallons of milk, then your utility is 77. Now note that I have marked four consumption bundles here that all have the utility level of 100. So what this means is that if you are consuming three apples and nine gallons of milk, give, you're having the same utility than consuming six apples and four gallons of milk, okay? So you can see that various combinations of milk and apples is going to give you the same utility. But as expected, if you are consuming, if you're decreasing the consumption of milk, say from nine to five, then you have to increase your consumption of apples in order to get the same level of utility. Now, what we are going to do next is we are going to not look at this in table format, but we are going to look at this in uh, three dimensions. So as you can see is you have the 25, the utility of 25, which is the lowest level of utility uh, from consuming one apple and one uh, milk or one gallon of milk. Whereas the highest utility is if you're having, if you're consuming 10 apples and 10 gallons of milk. So this table here, you can also represent that in a three-dimensional graph, which is what I have done on this uh, plot here. So on the, on the one axis, on the X axis, you have the consumption of apples. On the uh, Y axis, you have the consumption of milk. And then on the Z axis, uh, you have the consumption of, uh, or you have the utility, okay? That is, that you get from a particular uh, consumption level. 
So we have seen that at this point right here, where you are consuming 10 units of apples and 10 units of milk, that your utility level is 143. And that at the level where you consume one apple and one unit of milk, so right here, that the utility is uh, 25. Okay. Now, we mentioned before that if you are consuming uh, three apples and nine gallons of milk, that it gives you the same utility of 100 than uh, five apples and five gallons of milk. Okay. Now, let us consider, let us assume that this, this line here is the level where, or is the, uh, are the consumption bundles that give you a utility level of 100, okay? Now, I want you to think back about what you showed, uh, what I showed you at the beginning of this video, where we talked about contour lines, okay? Now, think about this, three-dimensional graph that you can also look at it from uh, from above where you have contour lines like this one that shows you all the combinations of milk and apples that give you a utility level of 100 okay and so for example uh, the utility level uh, right here maybe for example all the bundles that give you a utility of 80 of 80. So you can see that this one here is like a contour line that shows you all the, uh, all the utilities or all the uh, consumption bundles that give you the same uh, utility. And a contour line like this is called an indifference curve, okay? So what this means is that between all those consumption bundles on this line, you are indifferent, okay? You could not say that one is better than the other. That is different if you are considering a consumption bundle, say, right here, and a consumption bundle that is um, uh, right here. Let's call, this, uh, let's call this A, and let's call this B, okay? Then here, since A is on a higher contour line or on an indifference curve associated with a higher level of utility, that A is preferred to B. But B and C are indifferent from each other, okay? Now note that at the top here, okay, I have looked at uh, or I have generated the picture such that it shows the different contour levels in this um, in this uh, plane here, okay. Now note that what I'm going to show next is where we are looking at this uh, at this top part part here, but we are looking at it from above. When we looked at the utility function in the one good case we were able to represent it in two dimensions easily, in the sense that we had the units consumed on the horizontal axis and we had the corresponding utility at the, on the vertical axis, and we were able to draw this utility function. Now, in the case of uh, two goods, it's a little bit more complicated, but it is also possible to draw the utility from two goods uh, and uh, you do not need a three-dimensional space. And this comes back to what I showed you before in the sense that we can use contour lines. So let us stay with the case where we have uh, apples and we have milk, okay? So we have two goods. So in this case, let's put apples here and milk on the vertical axis. <laughs> now then think about the picture from before and think about now that we are looking from above, okay? 
So what we can do is we can draw contour lines or we called them indifference curves that represent the preferences of the consumer. So here an individual line is an indifference curve. Okay. And an, a particular indifference curve is associated with a level of utility. Suppose here you have a level of utility of 80, a util utility level of uh, 100, and say a utility of 120. Now it is important to realize that there are many, there is an infinite number actually, there is an infinite number of indifference curves in this, uh, in this graph, and I have simply picked three. Think back about the mountain that you can be on an infinite number of different heights. Okay. Now note that what this indifference curve curves do is that it connects all the points that make you indifferent between two bundles. So if you're thinking about point A here, okay, that is associated with um, a low quantity of apples and a higher quantity of milk and you are indifferent between the consumption bundle A and consumption bundle B, where you have more apples and uh, less milk. Okay? And it should be clear that those indifference curves are always downward sloping because you, in order to stay on the same level of utility, there's a trade-off involved that if you are re reducing your consumption of milk, in order to be as happy as before, you have to increase the consumption of something else. In this case, you have to increase the consumption of apples. It should also be clear, and I have mentioned this before, that indifference curves do not intersect. Okay, So you cannot be at a utility level of 100 and a utility level of 120 at the same time. Okay? Now, you should also consider, and we are coming, uh, we are talking about this later, that simply because your budget changes, uh, it does not change your preferences. Okay, so here uh, we are assuming that your preferences um, remain uh, remain the same. Now, what is more peculiar is why I have drawn them um, shaped or bent inward. Okay, or why are they uh, bent like this? So the reason for this, uh, for this uh, particular curvature, is the diminishing marginal utility. Okay, this is a concept that we have seen um, that we have seen uh, previously in the case of consuming uh, one good. Okay, and this concept is responsible for the shape of the utility functions, uh, or for the shape of the indifference curves in this case. So why is this the case? Okay, let me just draw one indifference curve. And we are staying with the example of apples and milk. And so here we have this uh, one uh, indifference curve. Okay, and let us consider uh, a point here. Let's call this point A. And let us, con let us uh, assume that you are moving away from this point. In the sense that you are decreasing your consumption of milk. Now, if you are con decreasing your consumption of milk, okay, then what happens, and it may be helpful to consider the uh, picture above, so think about this case, the Q here, think about this of milk, okay, where initially you are at a point here. Okay. Let's call this uh, point A. And then when you are decreasing your consumption of milk, then your, your utility is decreasing, but it is actually decreasing at an increasing rate in this case. Okay, so the, if you're decreasing your consumption of milk, if you're getting less fewer and fewer gallons of milk, 
then your utility is decreasing faster and faster. Okay, And this is associated with the diminishing marginal uh, utility. Now, what this means is in this case that if you are decreasing your uh, consumption of milk, okay, then your decrease, your decrease in utility is, uh, is um, getting more and more extreme, okay, or larger and larger. So in order to keep you at the same level, uh, at the same level of happiness, because of the decreasing marginal utility, I have to compensate you with more and more apples, okay? Because your, your utility is decreasing so rapidly. Hence, because of this, you have this, uh, this uh, bent inward or convex to the origin uh, indifference curve, okay? And you do not have uh, straight lines. Now, suppose that we are again in the apples and milk space and consider this consumption bundle right here in the middle and let's call this D, okay? And this is some combination of apples and milk. Now the question is how would we know which bundles are preferred to D, which bundles are not preferred to D and which bundles are potentially indifferent. So note that at the you can determine this by having those, uh, those dashed lines here through this consumption bundle. And you can see that everywhere in this area here, you have fewer apples and you have fewer milk compared to D. And hence, since more is always better, this region here is not preferred. So any consumption bundle which is in this reason, region, is not preferred compared to consumption bundle D, okay? So this is the not preferred region. Now, any consumption bundle that gives you more apples and more milk compared to D has to be preferred because more is better. So everything here is preferred. Okay. Now, what about those other regions? This one and this one. Note that here, you do not know whether the consumption bundles in this region are preferred to the not preferred or potentially indifferent. So, Think about that you are going to have. Think about that you are going to have an indifference curve, which goes through D. Something like this, okay. Then, depending on how this indifference curve um, is drawn, you could have. You could have a bundle which is right here. Then, in this case, let's call this bundle C then in this case bundle C would be uh, indifferent to D. You could have a bundle here. Let's make it uh, here. Then in this case let's call this bundle B. Then bundle D would be preferred to bundle B. Or you could have say a bundle A here where bundle A is preferred to bundle D. So what this means is that in those areas here, or in this quadrant here, and in this quadrant here, you are in the situation where you are, are potentially indifferent. We are now combining the two important cons components of consumer theory, budget constraint and preferences, in order to determine consumer choice. If you remember from budget constraints, then we have the physical quantities on the axis. So in this case, assume that X stands for apples and Y stands for milk. So here we have drawn the budget constraint with the physical quantities on the axis. Note that we have done the same with 
the consumer preferences, where we have the physical quantities of apples and milk on the axis. Okay, so these are uh, quantities. So units of apples and units of milk. Okay. Now, what this means is we can combine consumer preferences and the budget constraint in the same graph. So let's do this and assume that we have a budget constraint for apples and milk that looks like this. Okay. Now, and assume that we have the budget constraint. So we have the um, indifference curve, which represents consumer preferences. Note that I have drawn simply one indifference curve. And the green line represents the budget constraint. Okay. Now, suppose that the consumer is choosing bundle A. Now, the question is, is this bundle efficient or can the consumer do better? And note that at bundle A, you could reduce your consumption of milk and increase your consumption of apples and end up at bundle B, for example. Now, at bundle B, The consumer has less milk, has more apples compared to A, but note that the consumer is on the same indifference curve. What this means is that the consumer is as happy at bundle A than they are at bundle B. However, bundle B, since it is inside the budget set, is cheaper than bundle A. And hence, if the consumer chooses at bundle A, then the consumer is not maximizing their utility. So what this means is that given this budget constraint, the consumer can reallocate uh, apples and milk and end up on a higher budget uh, on a higher indifference curve given the budget constraint. Suppose the consumer picks bundle A, uh, bundle, sorry, bundle C. Now here, bundle C is as expensive as bundle A, but the consumer is happier at bundle C because bundle C is on a higher uh, level of utility than bundle A. Okay. At the point where the indifference curve is tangent to the budget constraint is our optimal choice. This is where the consumer maximizes uh, their utility. Okay. Note that the slope of the indifference curve represents the marginal rate of substitution. And this marginal rate of substitution is telling you at which ratio you have to exchange, in this case, milk for apples to remain on the same indifference curve. And remember that the budget constraint, the slope of the budget constraint, is the ratio of the uh, prices. Okay? the prices for apples and milk in this case. And hence, at the optimal choice, the marginal rate of substitution is equal to the ratio of the prices. Okay. Now, if you're doing any type of analysis involving difference curves and involving uh, 
budget constraints, okay, then you should keep the following in mind. So let's have it more generic. We have the good X here, or the quantity of good X, and we have the quantity of good Y here. And then you have an indifference curve. And you always start off with that the consumer is at the level of the optimal choice, okay? where the marginal rate of substitution is equal to the ratio of the prices. What you should consider is that this entire area here, okay, is preferred to the initial choice, but is not affordable because, because it is outside the budget set. Okay? And when you're doing policy analysis, what you are assuming is that something changes with regard to the budget constraint and that the consumer is then choosing a new good or a new consumption bundle that is consistent where the marginal rate of substitution is equal to the ratio of the prices. And note that the goal of the consumer theory is to derive the demand function of the consumer. And this is what we are going to do next. And while we are deriving the demand function, then you will also see of what it means if the budget constraint of the consumer changes and how the, cons and how the consumer readjusts their consumption. Let us show how we can derive the demand function using consumer preferences, budget constraints, and the optimal choice of a consumer. Now, in this case, we are going to derive the demand function for apples. And what I have drawn on top here is the graph that we have seen before. We have an indifference curve, and that indifference curve is tangent to the budget constraint. And where it is tangent to the budget constraint, let's call this bundle A. This is where the consumer, that this is what the consumer chooses to consume apples and milk. Now at the bottom of this graph, I have drawn a second graph where on the horizontal axis, we again have the quantity of apples, but on the vertical axis, we now have the price of apples, okay? Now, since we have consumption bundle A, which is associated with a particular quantity of apples, let's call this particular quantity of apples Q1, then we can also draw Q1 at the, in the second graph at the bottom. Okay. Now, keep in mind that because we have Q1, or because we know of how many apples are consumed, and because we, are draw, we have drawn these budget constraints, we also know what the price of apples is, because otherwise we, were not, we would not have been able to draw the budget constraint. Now, in this case, assume that the price of apples is at P1. So here, let's call this P1. Okay. So here again, this represents the price of apples. Okay. If the price of apples here in this case is at P1, and of course we would also have a price of milk and income, but this is not under consideration right now, then if the price of apples is P1, then we are here consuming here at Q1. Now suppose that apples are getting more expensive in the sense that the price of apples is increasing. Now, if the price of apples is increasing and the, quant the price of milk remains the same, then what we have is we have uh, the budget constraint pivoting inwards like this. Now, if the budget constraint pivots inwards, then we cannot afford our consumption bundle A anymore. And the consumer has reallocated the consumption of, of apples and milk in order to 
achieve the optimal choice. And suppose that the consumer is now consuming at point B, or it's consuming a consumption bundle B, which is at a lower level of utility. Okay, this is because uh, apples became more expensive. Okay, so now let's assume that we call this level of apples consumed Q2. Now note that this reallocation of consumption has to do or was, uh, has to do because the price of apples increased. Okay, so if the price of apples increased, this means that we now have the consumption bundle Q2, which is associated with a higher price of apples, and let's call this higher price P2. Now, suppose that the price of apples is increasing even further, then you have now uh, another new budget constraint, okay, that pivots down inwards even further, and the consumer is now reallocating their consumption and is consuming at point C. Yeah. Now again, point C is associated with a lower level of utility than B. And this is because the price of apples increased and hence the consumer cannot afford as many apples as before. Yeah. Now at point C, let's assume that the consumer is consuming Q3, the quantity Q3 of apples. And since that was forced because of a higher price, we are now having a P3, a higher price of apples. So now what you can see in the bottom graph is you have the relationship between the price of apples, uh, sorry, between the quantity of apples and the price of apples. And if you do this for various uh, prices, you can observe what quantity of apples the consumer chooses. And hence, you're getting a graph that shows the quantity of, of apples consumed for various prices. And this relationship, when we have the physical units of, an, of a good on the horizontal axis and the price on uh, the vertical axis, we are talking about the demand function. Okay, So this black line here is the demand function for apples. Now, what I have illustrated here is how Economists think about a downward sloping demand function. Downward sloping in the sense that there is a negative relationship between the price of apples or the price of a good and the units consumed of a good. If the price is high, then fewer units are consumed. And if we are having a decrease in price, that results in an increase in the quantity consumed of apples.